Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! To the spending spree, then. We often ask where the money's coming from. Tonight, we look at where it's going. Is there a pattern between the geography of spending pledges and the seats the Tories need to gain to win a majority? Newsnight's been tracking where all the money promised by this government since July. From cash for schools, hospitals, towns, farmers will be spent. What, if anything, can that pattern of promises tell us about the Tories' strategy for the next election? Here's our economic editor, Ben Chu. Boris Johnson has no majority, and there's been no budget yet from this government. But there's nevertheless been a flurry of eye-catching spending announcements since he entered Number 10 Downing Street, including this weekend's promises of funding for 40 more hospital building projects. Sorry, sorry, sorry! But is this spending based purely on need, on socio-economic merit? After a decade of major austerity, there's undoubtedly plenty of need in the country. But is there electoral calculation too in where this money's going, as many claim? A data analysis by Newsnight suggests there might be, and that Number 10 has more than an eye on gaining an advantage in the next election. Who can give us some information about William Duke of Normandy? Oh, yeah. The levelling up of per-pupil school funding announced in the spending review sounds egalitarian, but education experts point out that the benefits actually accrue to wealthier areas. The levelling up policy announced by the government doesn't take into account any of the wider needs by pupils, whether they're disadvantaged or not. It only considers whether a school has below £5,000 per pupil if it's a secondary school or below £4,000 per pupil if it's a primary school. I think it's reasonable to say that the government announcement will target more funding to more affluent and generally more conservative areas. Newsnight's analysis shows that nine of the top ten beneficiaries in terms of boost per pupil in cash terms are in conservative held constituencies. Of the 80 constituencies that receive an average of £100 or more per pupil uplift, 84% were won by the Conservatives at the last general election. All but four of the 36 seats which get no uplift at all are Labour held. A fair amount of the money from other schemes appears to be going to marginal seats, where Labour is ahead of the Tories or the Tories have a relatively slim lead. 61 of the 108 constituencies set to benefit from a new fund for towns have majorities of less than 5,000. The same is true of around half the constituencies that benefit from another new fund for High Street. Yet only a quarter of all constituencies are marginals. Another characteristic of beneficiaries is a high leave vote. Around half of the towns and high street beneficiaries also had a leave vote in 2016 of more than 60%. Again, only a quarter of all constituencies had a leave vote that high in the referendum. So, in other words, the types of seats that Boris Johnson probably needs to take in the next election are over-represented in these lists of spending beneficiaries. This shows all the constituencies in the country due to benefit from two or more slugs of the spending announced since July. Let's take a closer look at the North. Wakefield, a Labour Conservative marginal, is a beneficiary of both the new Towns Fund and another pot of money for historic high streets. 62% there voted leave in the 2016 referendum. Or Doncaster North, where Labour's majority is a sizeable 14,000 but it did have a whopping 71% leave vote. And it's likely to benefit from new health spending as well as funding for high streets and the wider town. Both constituencies, incidentally, were visited by Boris Johnson in September. But are we reading too much into these spending announcements? Not all the seats that benefit are marginal. And urban experts point out that many towns happen to be marginal seats and that many towns voted majority leave. So perhaps it's not that surprising to see them over-represented. Any uh, party that wants to get into government needs to be thinking about towns because that's where the marginal seats are. Analysts also note promises of funding for places such as Swindon and Milton Keynes, both containing marginal seats, which are hard to classify as left-behind towns. And Nuneaton, the important national bellwether seat currently held by the Tories, has promised money for both its town and its high street. Milton Keynes is probably the one that, that sticks out the most on the list um, because, you know, 
at the uh, it's, it's no different to the national voting pattern in terms of people wanting to leave the EU and it doesn't have any real deprivation. Uh, but they, they are a small number of an anomalies. Most of the towns on the list uh, do have high, um, you know, are associated with high levels of deprivation. And up in Scotland, where the Conservatives are defending 13 seats with relatively small majorities, farmers have been promised an extra £210 million of government support across Scotland. But that has been met with dismay by Welsh farmers who say they've been left short-changed by the decision. When an additional £5,500 is allocated per head to Scottish CAP recipients, uh, you have to raise the question as to whether that's a political move ahead of a general election. Now, none of this is an exact science, and it's worth bearing in mind that these are not particularly large sums in the context of a decade of spending cuts. The announcements are mainly symbolic, gaining favourable headlines in local media. Take cash. But perhaps it is possible to discern the outlines of a likely Conservative electoral strategy by following the money. That was Ben Chu. Now, Downing Street spokesman said people want Brexit done and government to deliver on the public's domestic priorities. We're determined to invest in our infrastructure, high streets, NHS and schools across the country. After too much dither and delay, we won't hold back on giving the public what they want. Well, joining us now, Mercy Moroki from Conservative Women's Organisation for Diversity. She introduced Sajid Javid, the Chancellor, on stage today. Matt Chorley is the editor of The Times Red Box. Stuart Jackson is a former Conservative MP and former Chief of Staff to David Davis when he was Brexit Secretary. And Jennifer Williams is political editor of the Manchester Evening News. Welcome all and I'm going to just start with something that's in the Times tomorrow and this is suggesting Stuart perhaps you can um, help us understand this a bit that Boris Johnson would ask the EU to rule out an extension from their end in exchange for a promise from him to get a deal through. Does that sound like a workable premise compromise? I think it does. I was speaking to a senior cabinet minister tonight who feels that that is uh, a, a good way forward. I think it builds on the fact that there is momentum towards uh, getting a deal rather than no deal. And I, I think it, it, it is coming to the end game, the denouement of this process, where people are going to have to really think about what their real red lines are. And this is the last chance saloon for both uh, a deal and particularly for the EU and how much they want to specifically avoid no deal. So your understanding is th the two sides are are talking to each other. They are actually communicating and compromising at this point. I think there have been quietly talks taking place at a technical level, as you know, for several weeks. But uh, one of the irritating things about the prorogation decision was that it, it brought ministers back to Westminster rather than where they should have been, which is doing what what they should do to, to solve the issue, which is talk to their interlocutors, other politicians, because it's the political level that this crisis will be solved. Jen, I wonder if that makes what's happening here, all the spending pledges, um, less important, because that's the real news going on, or more important, because he's clearly gearing up for the next stage, sort of, you know, Tory Mark II. Um, he is, and I think, I think, well, I think there's a number of things, aren't there? I think the first thing to say is that everything that he seems to be doing at the moment is extremely short term. So this is designed to win an election. And I think there's two prongs to that. If he's going to win a majority, then he's going to need to win some of the seats that you were talking about in your package. And in order to win some of those seats, he's going to have to win over Labour voters who on a generational basis have not voted Conservative. So he needs to talk to them about Brexit, but he also needs to talk to them about domestic policy. So it's kind of a two-pronged thing. And so he is also talking about infrastructure. He's talking about building new hospitals. He's talking about, frankly, doing so much stuff that it's impossible to see how he could possibly afford it. Um, but it's almost like we've gone beyond the point where that even matters anymore. It's about, you know, it's, it's essentially about um, making that offer. And it's like fiscal rules. Like, uh, um, when was the magic money tree quote? Well, about five minutes ago, and that's just been Mercy, completely forgotten. You introduced um, Sajid We don't really hear about fiscal rules or having to stick yeah. to budget or, you know, not handing on debt. And yet they still berate the Labour government um, for overspending before they took power. How do you make sense of that? Well, I mean, I think I'd really welcome uh, the Chancellor's announcements. Um, actually, I think um, the 
announcements on the national living wage were particularly um, bold and it shows they've got um, an ambitious agenda. I particularly welcome the lowering of the threshold as well um, from 25 to 21. I think that's really important. It's going to lift um, people out of poverty. Uh, Four million uh, workers will be better off and I think it's mm. um, good for young people and um, their bank balances. Matt, you're a veteran at these things. What, what does you this... You make me sound ancient. Really <laughs> old, really old, so am I. But does this feel... Uh, we felt a bit flat today and we couldn't quite work out whether that was a, a good thing, everything's going according to plan, or as Jen says, that you don't know what to believe because actually so much stuff is being bandied around amidst all the claims and the, you know, the sort of sexual allegations as well, that you sort of, you, you haven't quite got a sense of, of reality here. Yeah, and I think Mercy's right. The, the announcement on the national living wage is big. It's, I don't think it's on any of the front pages mm. tomorrow. Mm. Uh, it's, a, it's a big, it, and it feels like they're, they're trying to fight on so many fronts at the moment. On the one mm. hand, they're talking to Brussels and mm. trying to get that deal sorted out. They're also supposedly trying to speak to Labour MPs to get them on side if they do get a deal. But they're also identifying marginal seats in pots of money in school projects and hospitals, which feels like that's so far away from... If he doesn't get a deal, that the impact that could have on the Tory party, either with a chaotic no deal or not delivering on his promise on leaving on the October the 31st, it's going to have such a massive impact on the Tory party. I think they're looking at retail because one of the problems in the 2017 election is we failed the lift test. You get in the lift, you've got 10 mm. seconds to sell the Tory party mm. policy and we didn't have anything to say. You can't say I think Corbyn's rubbish. too much at the gonna, moment. There's well, so much sort of his big yeah, scattergun. But actually mm. what they're trying to do now is develop a compelling and attractive narrative. I think Jen's slightly unfair. What we're actually saying as a party is probably, look, the Brexit nightmare will end, and then you're going to you're going to actually start on the side have of a to bus, think though. The about Brexit transport, nightmare will end. social care, that, health, that's schools. That's completely right, and that's something that so many people are crying out for. But how are you going to pay for it? Like genuinely, how are you going to pay for it? And what happens when we get past an election, and actually it turns out that economically we can't pay for it? What does that do for trust? Well, I think when I said it's retail, it's actually addressing the things that people have felt, all governments, but in fairness, the May government as well, have been ignoring police numbers, mm. school budgets, mm. you know, social care eventually we're going to be looking at, at crime generally. And I think that's important. And you, you can't really decry Boris Johnson for at least talking about these issues. I think the challenge for Labour is actually be to, to, to put forward compelling and demonstrably believable policies at a decent price. Well, he's trying no, to so let me just ask you, is, is trust a big issue at the moment? You're with the Conservative Women's mm. Organisation. A lot of these questions have come back to whether they trust the character at the heart mm -hmm. of this government. Do they trust Boris Johnson with women, with language, with, with what he says. Do you find it, it, him hard to defend? Um, I think what is important um, more than anything, to be honest, is getting Brexit done. I think we've been seeing um, a lot of distractions, a lot of false outrage about things that have been happening. Um, so when you say false outrage, you don't think anyone really minds? You don't think anyone in the party minds or you don't think anyone in the country minds? I, I think that, you know, Boris... The taxpayers' money and stuff like that? Or? I think Boris, um, you know, the members very definitively chose Boris to, um, you know, be their leader. And um, I definitely think that there is trust in Boris and we've seen that the Conservatives are the only party who are willing to deliver Brexit. So the, the, theory, think... the theory we keep on hearing is that, you know, the, the Dom Cummings sort of modelled on, on Clinton's re-election, that as long as... Boris Johnson goes out and talks to the country and sells it to the country. Everyone in here and everyone in the Westminster sort of bubble and village can talk about this stuff as much as they want and it doesn't matter. Do you think that's fail-safe? It's sort of what happens with every government when they get into trouble. You know, with Gordon Brown, when Westminster was saying he was losing the plot, they'd say, oh, if, you know, when he goes out and meets real people, that's where it's all good. Like Mrs Duffy. Well, <laughs> say that, yeah. And they sort of try to create this tension. I, uh, I was doing my stand-up show on Saturday night in Bowie St. Edmonds. I mentioned Dominic Cummings and I got pantomime style booze you know mm. Dominic Cummings says get out of London and find out what people think they don't like Dominic Cummings it turns out in uh, some but parts. do they still vote for Boris well I think Johnson. the entire country wants Brexit over mm. sorted one way or the other mm. we've had three and a half years so this I is what when, when Mercy exactly, uses that just, phrase get Brexit done get Brexit done all the banners here the, get that's Brexit done. Want, yeah. the Tory party want it done for them because otherwise the party is in massive trouble the country needs it done and I think People, a lot of people are willing to put aside stuff that previously they would have been furious about, whether mm. it's public money or private relationships or whatever. They're willing to put that to one and side. And do you think if he comes back with something that is imperfect to members of the ERG, then 
the rest of the party will turn around to them and say, get Brexit done, I just think sign it. Yeah, I think there's an element of that. I even, think the, even the Marc Francois, the Steve Bakers, the, the sort quite, of the Quite Puritans possibly, because they wouldn't want to contribute to what is a very significant decline in the authority of Parliament now. No, it's not a party political issue, but the voters are sick to death of Parliament. You know, they, they, they think that... MPs have essentially wasted three years when they should have been solving the issue and they're not focusing it's on what their It's a dangerous thing, that, isn't it? Because once you tell people that they're sick of Parliament, I think this was a point that Marina Hyde made and Claire Foge again today, then the next Parliament, you are stuck with that tag, that people will hate Parliament, well, look, even Emily, if it's full of Conservative I, MPs. I live, I live through the expenses, guys. I live through that nightmare. And, I, and it was were, damaging. It was damaging. Term. But remember, you know, we did pull that back, and with a new speaker, and I think that's going to be really, really important, a new speaker. Personally, I think uh, Lindsay Hoyle will be a fantastic new speaker, and I think he'd bring back the dignity and authority. Well, we don't know who's got the job yet, but l l let me ask if, whether if you, you think... If you I mean, if... If you, if you start throwing these words around, um, whether it's the proroguing of Parliament, whether it's the people versus the Parliament, can you then pull it back? Or do, I mean, do you think it is damaging a, a party longer term? You know, this is, this is sort of trashing the, the Conservative reputation, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think um, what people care more about is um, MPs trashing democracy more than anything. I mean, we there is... parliamentary democracy, don't we? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 you know, people voted to leave because they wanted to bring back parliamentary, um, to bring back uh, sovereignty to parliament. So I think um, the erosion that we've seen of democracy is actually more damaging than anything else, really. We've got a piece in the Times Web box tomorrow by James Johnson, who was Theresa May's pollster. Mm. Uh, it, not to join the election, he always likes to point out. And um, he says that actually, if you go around and do focus groups and polls and that sort of thing, the public aren't as caught up with this parliament versus yeah. people thing. He's been to America, where actually that sort of cultural divide of d Democrats and Republicans is much stronger. You can see I'm making that signal thing that means we're going to fall <laughs> off air. That's all for tonight. Thank you all very much indeed. Uh,